This is a famous song from the 1934 show Anything Goes, Cole Porter's most famous Broadway score. This lyric is a good example of three Cole Porter qualities. First, it's a catalog song, like Let's Do It, Let's Fall in Love. It heaps one metaphor on top of another. Second, it features all kinds of cultural and historical references and allusions. To create humor, Porter jumbles together lowbrow cultural references with highbrow references from classical history and literature. Third, this features Porter's innovative use of rhyme and, in this particular lyric, very short lines. In the 1930s and 40s, and even later, popular songs had two parts, the verse and the refrain. The verse came first and set the stage or established the context. You can remember that because verse and first almost rhyme. I have put the verse in italics. Let's read it. At words poetic, I'm so pathetic that I always have found it best, instead of getting them off my chest, to let them rest, unexpressed. I hate parading my serenading as I'll probably miss a bar. But if this ditty is not so pretty, at least it'll tell you how great you are. So this is a light-hearted love song. For those of you who don't read music, the word bar refers to a musical measure. So the speaker says, I'm so bad at poetry that I usually don't try to express what I feel. So don't expect much from this little ditty. A ditty is a slang word for a little song or rhyme. It might not be pretty. I'll probably even miss a bar. But at least my little ditty will tell you how great you are. And now we start the refrain. You're the top. You're the Colosseum. You're the top. You're the Louvre Museum. You're a melody from a symphony by Strauss. You're a Bindle bonnet, a Shakespeare sonnet, you're Mickey Mouse. Well, note that the first three references are to high-class things. The Colosseum the Louvre Museum, and a symphony by Strauss. The Colosseum is a great architectural feat of Roman antiquity. Here's a picture of it. And then the Louvre Museum is one of the great museums in the world, in Paris, France. And a symphony from the great classical composer Johann Strauss. In other words, you're pretty great. You're as great as all these great triumphs of the classical world. But then we've got, you're a Bindle bonnet. What in the world is that? Well, in 1934, Bindle's was an expensive clothing store in New York City. A Bindle bonnet was a really fashionable piece of headwear. Here's a picture of what a Bindle bonnet would have looked like in 1934. If you had one, you were chic. But then at the end of the stanza, after referring to a Shakespeare sonnet, he says, you're Mickey Mouse. Well, Mickey Mouse was a big deal in 1934. He was only six years old and was dominating the world of animation. But Mickey Mouse is a lowbrow reference compared to the Colosseum and a symphony and a Shakespearean sonnet. But that's Cole Porter. He jumbles cultural references for comic effect. I don't think we have time to go through every single stanza, but note in stanza two that the highbrow references like the Nile and the Tower of Pisa and the smile on the Mona Lisa are contrasted with the speaker himself, who is a worthless check, a total wreck, a flop. The pattern is repeated in the third stanza. 
the catalog continues with highbrow references at the beginning and a couple of lowbrow references at the, at the end. You're the top. You're Mahatma Gandhi. You're the top. You're Napoleon Brandy. You're the purple light of a summer night in Spain. You're the National Gallery. You're Garbo's salary. You're cellophane. Well, Mahatma Gandhi was an Indian peace leader and political activist, very serious guy. Napoleon Brandy is a very expensive French brandy. I looked it up once, and it's vintage 1875. But after referencing A Summer Night in Spain and the National Gallery, we get two comical references. Garbo's salary. What's that? Well, Greta Garbo was a great movie star, mostly of the silent picture era. She was reported to be the highest paid star in Hollywood, and fan magazines were full of stories about her. And then cellophane. It was a new product in 1934. It revolutionized things in the kitchen. So it was a big deal. Cole Porter's audience would have laughed at the rhyme and the comic contrast of the metaphors. The next stanza is fairly clear, I think, but let's look at the one after that. You're the top. You're an arrow collar. You're the top. You're a Coolidge dollar. You're the nimble tread of the feet of Fred Astaire. You're an O'Neill drama. You're Whistler's mama. You're Camembert. Well, there's a lot of stuff here. In 1934, most shirts didn't have collars. You bought the collar separately and fastened it on. Arrow collars were expensive. In fact, the Arrow Man, who was featured in magazine ads, was quite a popular guy. He got fan mail and everything, even though he wasn't real. Now, there's no such thing as a Coolidge dollar. That is to say, there was no such thing as a dollar with President Calvin Coolidge's picture on it. But remember that 1934 was the depth of the Depression. Dollars were scarce. But Calvin Coolidge was president before the Depression hit when dollars were a lot more plentiful and people had money. So the reference to a Coolidge dollar is a reference to better times. And what's the nimble tread of the feet of Fred Astaire? Fred Astaire was probably the greatest show dancer who ever lived. Certainly he was the preeminent dancer of the 1930s, a great dancing star of Broadway and movies. Everyone in 1934 knew who Fred Astaire was. An O'Neill drama is another high-class reference. It refers to the serious playwright Eugene O'Neill, who was transforming American theater with new ideas of realism. Whistler's Mama is a jokey way of referring to the classic piece of art Whistler's Mother by James Whistler. It's a famous 19th century American painting. And finally, there is the reference to Camembert which is a really expensive French cheese that was a delicacy among high-class folks. So look at the range and the sweep of the metaphors. They do expect quite a bit from the audience, but a lot of these popular references would just have been a part of the cultural literacy of 1934. In the stanza which follows, we've got more humor. You're a rose, you're Inferno's Dante, you're the nose on the great Durante. I'm just in a way, as the French would say to trop, but if baby I'm the bottom, you're the top. Well, there's the highbrow reference to Dante's Inferno, although Cole Porter places it in a spot where it has to be mispronounced because... Dante is rhymed with Durante. Well, Jimmy Durante was a lowbrow comedian with a big nose. 
a great popular entertainer for many decades. And also note that the French phrase de trop, meaning too much, is placed so that it must be mispronounced. We have to pronounce it de trop so that it rhymes with the top. Now, this is really slick because Jimmy Durante's, one of the features of Jimmy Durante's comic routines was that he mispronounced words. That was just one of his things. And so in this stanza that is kind of built around the reference to Jimmy Durante, Cole Porter places words so that they have to be mispronounced. A little tip of the hat to Jimmy Durante. Well, I'm about out of time on this podcast, but you get the way Cole Porter works. This isn't a theme poem, but it's a tour de force of wit and language use. It utilizes a lot of poetic devices. And once again, the song itself is on CourseWeb so that you can listen to it. <laughs> 